and welcome to part two of the slides of chapter six. This chapter is dealing with consumption, time allocation, and production choices. So why are we interested in these topics um, for development economics? Um, before you continue watching this uh, video, you should maybe read the box 6.2 the impact of rice price increase on child labor in vietnam here you can see the little um, article that i was talking about please feel free to pause the video and read this before continuing okay so why are we doing this as you saw in the previous text it can be important for many uh, decisions of uh, policy makers such as um, child labor for example probably the central goal of development economics is the well-being of the people and understanding the constraints or time allocation is very important to understand of well-being but also um, it is important to understand the labor markets because time allocation is the basis that is affecting labor supply significantly so first of all we need to recognize the simple fact that um, there are both benefits and costs to working obviously the benefit is the earning which allows me consumption of goods and services however there are also costs to it and the cost is also pretty obvious which is the time that I dedicate to working I could spend for other uses that are also very valuable to me so the little trick that we are using here is just treating time simply as if it was another good that I would be able to consume so essentially if we divide our time between working time and leisure time we can understand leisure time as a good that we are consuming so in other words we have a total fixed time of capital T, what you see here in red, and you must choose how to allocate that time between various activities. As I said, we can simply think of those various activities as working time and leisure time. We are assuming further that a person can choose to work as many times as he likes of course uh, up to a total amount of t not more than that and for every hour that person earns a wage w and of course we are assuming that the person is a homo economicus uh, who is maximizing the utility and the utility is a function of the goods and services that you can buy as well as the function of your leisure time or home time that you get to enjoy and as usual we are assuming that the utility is a positive and diminishing function of consumption expenditure and home time so both of these have diminishing marginal return meaning twice the amount of a consumption is better but it's not twice as good uh, and the same thing is valid for home time so a person is valuing uh, let's say six hours of free time per day over three hours of free time free time per day but not exactly twice as much so for the analysis we make a graph again similar to what we did in the beginning part of this chapter in my previous video and for that purpose we put the time on the x-axis and consumption on the y-axis now when it comes to time we have to distinguish again between the home time which is also the leisure time and we abbreviated with capital H, H for home time, and the time that you work, which we abbreviate with S because the time that you work is essentially your labor supply. And of course, the sum of the two times, so H plus S must be equal T, and T is the total time that you have. What is also important to remember is that we have the home time, measured here from the origin so on the left hand side of the time axis we have the home time and on the right hand side we have the labor time never the other way around so that's important to remember 
Now, what about the y-axis? Well, on the y-axis, we have the consumption of goods and services. And of course, the larger we choose S, our working time, the, the labor supply, the smaller will, will be H, which is my home time or the leisure time. And accordingly, the higher will be then my consumption. So that's the basic idea. So we have always a trade-off between the home time or leisure time and consumption. Then we have another element to build in and that is M and that's the amount of non-labor income that you have. In other words, if you have some sort of passive income, some income that you would have regardless of the work hours, that is considered as M, meaning even if I choose to work zero hours my labor supply would be zero my entire time is dedicated to be a leisure time or home time i would still be able to consume m dollars of non-labor income and accordingly i can only consume my non-labor income so that m which is my non-labor income and t that represents the one end of my budget constraint so that's essentially the smallest budget that I have if I choose to not work at all or if for some other reasons I cannot work at all. Now that we have the one end of my budget constraint, we are looking for the other end of the budget constraint. And how do we get that one? Well, this is where wage is coming into the picture. And the calculation that I have to make is for every hour of work, how much additional after-tax income do I have? How much more money do I have to available for me to consume? And that is essentially determining the slope of my budget constraint. And given that, I reduce hour for hour for hour of my leisure time and add it to my work supply. Uh, so per hour less of home time or leisure time, I get W dollars more to consume and so on and so forth until I have no home time and I, I would be on the other extreme where I would choose to spend my entire time on working. Now all I need to do is connecting the two ends and what I have here is my budget line. So essentially I can create a formula for the amount of consumption for an individual and that equals m which was my non-labor income plus w which is my salary multiplied with the working hours and the working hours is nothing else than t which is the total time that i have minus h which was my home time or leisure time with a very simple re expression simply multiplying the w the wage with t and h I can re-express that equation in a way that I have an intercept and a slope for my budget constraint. And this is how it looks. My intercept would be M plus W times T. So essentially the maximum money that I could possibly earn by having no home time and only working time, the way I would choose to spend all my time on working. And the slope would be simply my, um, hourly wage after taxes so i will not mention after tax or before tax uh, anymore because we are assuming for now that income tax is zero percent which means that our after tax and before tax income would be the same now i have the first part that i need for the analysis which is the budget constraint which has a kink here by m at the amount of m um, if you are doing that analysis for a very poor person where well, that person would have zero dollars of income if the person would choose to not work at all then it would make it simpler the line would go just all the way down to t so there, there would be no kink in that scenario on my budget line but other than that the budget line has a kink so this is the first part that i need now for the second part i need to look again into the indifference curve as you remember each indifference curve is representing a certain level of utility so for example here this indifference curve the top one represents a higher level of utility than the indifference curve in the middle and that one represents a higher level of utility than the lower one and of course each point on each indifference curve would represent 
a certain combination of hours that you choose to stay home that you can use for your leisure and also um, consumption of goods and services. You certainly remember from my previous video that consumers are maximizing their utility by finding the tangency between um, the indifference curve and the budget constraint which would be in this case this point here. Now let's take a look into some questions and those would be for example what are the determinants of labor supply and what do we learn about the determinants of well-being. Pause the video and think for a couple of seconds about the possible answer here. Well, some of the determinants of labor supply are here on the x-axis and those are home time H, labor supply S, and the two together added up is of course my total hours available T. But there is more into it. The other thing would be essentially the price of the goods that you consume and also your preferences of course so essentially kind of like your taste if you want if a person is valuing home time more versus a person who is valuing consumption more accordingly the indifference curves could look different they would be more standing or more leaning depending on what type of a person we are dealing with and that would yield to a different point of equilibrium on the budget constraint even if the salaries are the same. Now what are the determinants of well-being? Again of course T is relevant because assume that a person who is very sick or for some other reasons has constraints cannot experience the same level of well-being. Moreover if you remember M was the amount of money that you would have even if you would choose to not work at all so kind of like your passive income that's also determining because the lower M would essentially shift the entire demand curve down that is supposed to be a parallel line and the higher M would shift the entire demand curve up another factor is of course your wages your salary because the salary would have an effect that if your salary is higher you would have a rotation of the budget constraint along M and if your salary is lower you have a rotation inwards of course and that also is very important and last but not least is of course the prices of goods and services that you are considering and then of course we might end up having some corner solutions that could be for example here on this end which is a case where a person chooses to not work at all and you would end up here at the point or you can also have the other extreme of course for that other extreme you need uh, indifference curves that are shaped differently but then you would end up essentially landing for example at um, yeah the other corner where you would essentially work every minute of free time that you have Okay, so here's another question. What happens if we take M, which was the amount of money that the person would um, have, like passive income, uh, without working at all? So if you would spend all your time, uh, choose to spend it as home time. What happens if we increase that M? So for example, maybe government gives some transfer. So we go from M0 here to M1 there. As you see, the entire budget line shifts upwards. There is a parallel shift because the wage didn't change. So that's why the, sh the shift has to be parallel. There is no rotation here. And as you see, we move from the, the old equilibrium, which I mark here as orange, to this new equilibrium, this other orange point. In this new equilibrium, the household has more money available for consumption but there is more into it let's take a closer look first of all the household chooses to have more home time the old home time was here and the new home time is here so here's h0 the old home time this is the new home time which means 
that labor supply goes back from S0 here to S1 here. So essentially another interpretation would be that the household chooses to spend part of the increase on the consumption on more home time. So he buys himself essentially more home time by choosing to work less and having less labor income. So only part of that is going towards consuming more goods and services and part of it goes towards essentially buying yourself more home time. Now the next question would be here what happens if the labor income increases and the non-labor income is the same. As I mentioned before, your wage is determining the slope of your budget constraints. So a higher wage means a change in the slope of your budget constraint. Higher wage means a higher slope. So what you have is essentially a rotation of your budget constraint where your fixed point is here at the intercept of M and T. Now that we have a higher labor income, let's take a look what happened. The person, not surprisingly, is choosing to work more. So as you see, S labor supply increases while the home time decreases. Why? Because home time has now a higher opportunity cost for every hour that I spend um, more on my leisure time. I'm losing more income and accordingly I have to give up more consumption of other goods and services. So as you see my S increases while my H decreases. So my S was before only this much and now it has risen by this amount. So what happens to my well-being? The well-being it has risen as you can see we are now on a higher indifference curve and labor supply as I mentioned before also increases. Now you might be wondering how a change in wage that seems to be pretty substantial has only a pretty small effect in labor supply so you might be surprised about that why is that in order to answer the question we need to take a closer look into the mechanisms behind it. Because what we saw was the final uh, product, the final effect. But that final effect consists itself of two other effects. Those two effects are income effect and substitution effect. Now what are income and substitution effect? Let's take a look. Substitution effect is focusing only on the fact that wage increase yields leisure time or home time being more expensive. So for every hour of home time, I have to give up more salary. What it ignores is, however, that the higher salary means that I am in a better position, I am wealthier, my well-being is increasing. So the increase in household's potential income is essentially ignored. The income effect does the opposite. The income effect ignores the fact that every hour of home time is now um, more expensive uh, if we look into the um, opportunity cost of it um, and only focuses on the effect that higher wage means that I'm being better off, uh, my potential income is higher. Now the final product what we see is a combination of these two. So what does the substitution effect mean graphically? If you take a look graphically, what we would need to do is we would need to draw a budget line that is parallel to the new budget line that we have given the higher salary, but has at the same time a point of tangency with my old indifference curve because here we have, I call it I0. That's my indifference curve before the wage increase and here I have I1 which is the level of my new indifference curve after the wage increase. So we are looking here on the fact that if I would have been kept at my old level of utility with the higher wage, how much indeed would I choose to work and that is essentially focusing solely on the effect of substitution of home time and working time 
solely based on the fact that I have a higher wage and it is essentially ignoring the fact that the higher wage yields me being on a higher potential income level and as we see the increase in labor supply is higher than the end result that we observed why because we are ignoring the fact that the household is wealthier and as we saw before being wealthier means that you choose to work less and spend more time at home so this is only the effect of increase in labor supply only and only due to the fact that wage is higher that every hour of home time is now more expensive however we have also the income effect and what does that mean again as i said income effect means that i'm now wealthier i have higher potential income because of that i consume more of all normal goods and home time is a normal good as i showed you two three slides ago so if i am wealthier i choose to uh, have more home time or leisure time and work less so that is the effect that is working a little bit against it and that's exactly what we see here so that's why we get the final result being essentially there so this is my final result essentially which is the combination of the blue arrow and the red arrow together gives me the green arrow right so the substitution effect which is the blue arrow plus the income effect which is the red arrow but as you see the red arrow is working in the opposite direction as the substitution effect that's why the final result which is the total effect the green arrow is smaller than the substitution effect if we have the case where the substitution effect would be larger than the income effect so essentially the red arrow would be larger than the blue arrow what we would have at the end would be that the green arrow would go to the right which means that i am dealing here with an inferior good okay so now we have explained why um the effect on labor supply is relatively small even if we are looking at a pretty large uh, change in wage and that's because of the substitution effect working against the income effect so the two are kind of to some extent uh, balancing each other out so as i said they are to some extent um, balancing each other out but empirical work has shown that the net effect is positive so higher wage means generally more hours of work so that income effect is not as large as a substitution effect so as i mentioned before there is this other factor that we can take into consideration which is increasing well-being and that is increasing available time t so what kind of policies might we think of as increasing available time t pause the video and think a little bit about it so if you think about it for example a better infrastructure uh, would increase the time that households can spend for working uh, think of better roads that reduces commuting time for people to get to work and coming back or if you think of very poor uh, households in very poor rural uh, villages um, they might have to spend hours and hours of their daily time to go and carry water from a distant source or to go out and search for firewood and things like that so if we have a piped water system that would save them those hours they can spend those hours in having more working hours and more leisure time so how would that affect our model here well a higher t means that we would have a shift here outward if t is going here outward then my m is still at the same point but this point is also shifted outward which means the initial point for my budget constraint is shifted outward so my wage is we are still assuming remained the same but the maximum income that i can generate increases and um, as the final result this parallel shift allows the households 
to achieve a higher income and they are moving on a higher level of well-being as you can see from the indifference curve again here I have let's say I0 and here I have I1 there is a shift upward and also labor supply if we look here rises because before the increase of T households would work this quantity as zero and after the increase of T households will work this quantity S1 so as you can see households labor supply does increase but at the same time also their home time increases their home time increases by the amount of this red line and their labor supply increases essentially by the amount of the blue line minus the red line so essentially the blue line is representing how many hours of extra time they gain um, in their t the increase in t and the portion red of that goes towards more home time the remaining of that goes towards more working time or labor supply something we should not forget are also preference differences for example cultural prohibitions can prevent households from allocating any time of their female members uh, to you know go out and work and earn some salary and wage outside of the home also social norms can shape the value that parents have on their children in some countries you see that education is considered as something very important in other countries less important and also there are multiple ways to contribute to income so with the extra time maybe people choose to do some market work farm work um, and so on and so forth or sp spending more time doing housework and you know keeping uh, freeing up this way time for other family members to go out and earn an income Another thing that we need to take into consideration is since uh, home time or leisure time is a normal good, giving cash transfers to uh, poorer families yields to reduction of labor supply. So the total income would rise by less than the amount of the cash transfer because as I mentioned, it essentially raises that M, what they have, and we analyze it before if if your m rises you choose to work less hours and have more leisure times your income does increases your total income does increase but not quite as much as the amount of cash transfer would suggest the situation is slightly different if we give the cash transfer to a person who was not working before anyway um, because labor supply was zero before the cash transfer and is zero after the cash transfer so we cannot have any crowding out effect of labor income so if you do not want to discourage labor supply what one can do is targeting the cash transfers to incapacitated households as you see there is a very different forms of child labor so if you look for example Mongolia <coughs> has a higher percentage of child labor than Cameroon but um, in Mongolia not much of the child labor work is done in the market work outside of home most of them are working at home so they are more protected so I highly encourage you to read uh, chapter 63c which is about child labor on pages 127 to 130 in our book that is a very interesting discussion that goes beyond the scope of this uh, video. Thank you very much. That is it for this video and I will post other videos soon.